Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. So glad you're here uh, to discover Fresno. I hope your uh, other session was fantastic. Uh, I know I appreciated the intro piece you all had. So we're kind of adding in on, on that conversation. Uh, if you're not, if you're just joining us for the first time, I'll give a little context. But the heart of this breakout is, you know, we're stepping into this COVID season, trying to reflect as Christians and say, how does the gospel of Jesus Christ um, call us to live and to move forward? And one of the issues that uh, became to the forefront uh, was obviously continued racial tension in America. And so we just want to ask the question here um, with some of the folks on our panel, what, what is a Christian response? Like, what, how do we as Christians, how does our faith in Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ move us uh, to respond to the racial tension in our country? And so um, I'm super glad to have this panel. Uh, you guys are folks that I really respect. I listen to your voice. Um, and, uh, you know, as we, I'll, I'll do a little intro here. Um, but uh, I think as we go into this, speak for yourselves, right? Um, you're, you don't speak for everybody. You speak for who you are, your lived experience. So do that. Um, and obviously, let's look at Jesus as we do that, right? So that's the hope. So uh, before us, we have Brian King. So Brian King is an established leader here in our, our area, uh, recently uh, retired from Fresno Street Saints, handing off the baton to Mr. Joby Jones. <laughs> He says, I'm, I'm glad. With a smile. <laughs> yeah. And Brian is also a neighborhood pastor here at the Well Community Church. Uh, a lot of lived experience. Uh, something I learned, look at the bio, 2009 California Peace Prize Award and 1997 NAACP Image Award. Uh, been doing a lot of work around youth violence and gang prevention. So great to have you on this panel, Brian. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'm excited, man. Uh, when I look at this panel with you and Brad and Joby, man, you know, and, and see what God has done to really transform us, you know, and, and being able to uh, really uh, uh, talk a little bit about those, this, this issue that really uh, is a hard conversation and a hard topic. Yeah. But uh, we to have brothers that you love, just love mm -hmm. is a great deal, you know, to be able to Good. Well, glad to have you. Pastor Brad Bell, uh, been the pastor at the Welcome Community Church for, I don't, yeah, I don't uh, have almost 19 years 19 now. Years. Okay. So, uh, and, and really stepped into this conversation. I remember uh, us having some conversations and then you joined a, a race panel and then have really leaned in, uh, really built relationships and intentionally connected to those uh, different than you. So super glad to have you on this panel. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't uh, scheduled to be on the panel, which is why my mugshot <laughs> is not up there. But uh, after our morning session, Brian said, hey, do you mind jumping on? It might be good just to add some diversity to a panel on, you know, racial reconciliation, what that looks like. So delighted to be here and thankful to share the stage with these two guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Joby Jones, Pastor Joby Jones, now taking over Fresno Street Saints. Uh, again, been doing a lot of work. And as you even shared, uh, a lot of the work uh, that you've been doing has comes from personal experience. Um, and continues to be led. You are a leader in our valley. Uh, your name, uh, and I, I'm in the nonprofit space, keeps coming up over and over. So uh, you're doing good stuff. Your name's getting out there in a good way. Um, and I really appreciate you being on this panel. I appreciate it. And you know, coming in behind Ryan, them big shoes are filled. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just uh, taking a slow, right? Just, just going from the heart with this stuff, right? Understanding and I've had great mentors. I had great men pouring to me. Uh, and showing me what to and what not to do. So, and, and you, and a lot of this stuff is um, God ordained, right? We wouldn't be here having these conversations if it had not been for the Lord. So, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate this opportunity and to share and to be a part of this. Cool. Well, so how we design this? I put together about eight questions. There is no way we're going to get through all of them, uh, but we have some good questions ahead of us. Um, and obviously, I can't see your chat, so feel free to put comments and questions. Uh, we can share those uh, with the panel after, but we're not going to be able to get to those, uh, unfortunately. But I know this is going to be a super rich conversation. Um, and so, uh, again, with this heart is uh, we are trying to um, just listen. So as you as we respond, you each don't have to. If you don't have a, a comment or a thought that you want to add in, you don't have to. Um, or just keep picking up on each other. My goal is just to steward the conversation along. So if, if we're getting, you know, long-winded, I'll just say, hey, that's great. All right, we got a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, let's do that. So uh, we'll start off with question number one. You can put uh, question one there on the, on the slide background. 
Um, so during the COVID outbreak and global shutdown, uh, the murder of George Floyd drew global attention. So this was not just a local thing, this was national and international, right? I saw countries all throughout uh, having protests and talking about uh, George Floyd's death. Um, why do you think this was the issue? This was the cause? Well, I, I, think, I think there is some deep, deep rooted hurt and, and lacerations. And, and, and the more you continue to pull the scalp off of it, the, 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 maybe the worse of the infection gets. And so I think that uh, in this day and age where all this modern technology to really allow people to witness what we as African-Americans have been saying for years and for people of all ethnic backgrounds, race, classism, to really witness what has been said for years and watch a man um, struggle for his life and murdered on a uh, national scene. Because um, people are good people. And most people want to see, want to get facts, but you can't, facts can't be no clearer than that. And so good people decided to stand up and to uh, really say, no, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that was murder. And so uh, that's probably why everything was stirred up the way it was because of the deep hurt from the 60s, 70s, you, you name it. And uh, just now people of all nationalities, race and walk and, and, and countries, different countries stood up and said that enough is enough. And uh, to piggyback, I just think um, we've, we've seen it before, right? And, and we've seen it happen and happen. And, and there's no accountability or no one's held accountable. And I think um, that, that sparks a lot of that stuff too, right? So y'all gonna just keep doing this to us. Y'all just gonna keep allowing this to happen. And there ain't gonna be, be any repercussions. If we do something, there's instant repercussions, but now they can do something. So that's, that's where the anger comes in, the frustration comes in. And so now we're gonna make y'all listen to us, right? And, and which that, that's what happens when you're dealing with emotions and, and things, right? So that, that's what, I think that's what that was really about. It was just, people were tired of all that. Things are still going the same, ain't nothing changed all these years. So we just gonna act up, right? Yeah, I think maybe just my perspective, you know, not living the experience these guys have lived, that sense of it being a broken record and happening yeah. again and again is, is not something I had experienced personally. And yet, even uh, in this last year, there's multiple situations, high profile, very public situations. And one of the observations, just by personal admission, I have found is it was very easy for me to kind of want to play CSI and find out, well, what happened? Right, right. And was, did he resist arrest? Was there a weapon involved? Did he have a record? And in the process of talking like that, what I found is I, it's very easy to then disconnect from the hurt right. that my brothers and sisters are feeling. And uh, I think facts do matter. And, and I don't think the facts necessarily right. care about our feelings, but I think in order for me to love my brothers and love my sisters, there has to be a sense of recognition of loss and to enter into that. And, and what I found is, I think there was a frustration, it seemed like at least, from many in the black community saying, well, why aren't right. white brothers and sisters saying more? And, right. and, and at least for myself, the reason most people didn't say a lot is they're waiting to find out what happened. And in so doing, kind of communicating that the loss wasn't a loss right. that was worth grieving to right. begin with. Does that make sense? Right. So just, a, it was an interesting conversation. And in that, of course, that's where the division comes. Cause then there's a perception of uh, hard hearts of the white community or the perception of the black community that may not care about the details that surround the incident. And now you're polarized. And so uh, glad to be a part of a conversation that allows us to sort of uh, put ourselves in the other person's shoes and try to seek that oneness. So. Yeah, I think COVID really highlighted it too because we, could, we couldn't be distracted, right? Like in other spaces, we have time and we have things going on. And then during COVID, we're all kind of like, 
uh, there's not, I can't go anywhere. I'm seeing this over and over and over. So, um, so, you know, transition maybe into a personal reflection. So again, not asking you to speak um, for everybody's lived experience, but for each of you, a gentleman, and I'll, I'll target this one uh, for Joby and Brian specifically. Um, from your own perspective, question number two, um, from your perspective, what are some of the biggest tensions you feel being black in America? Uh, I, I think that, that that's a loaded question for me. Uh, I think that uh, the tension I feel, honestly, is that uh, my, my, my white brothers are afraid of me, not, not physically, but not afraid of me physically, but afraid of really reaching out to me because of what they might say to offend me. And I think that's what's stopping us from truly building great relationships. Uh, I, I, I've said this with Brad a number of times. Uh, I remember in the early 90s, and, and you're talking to a guy that was born in the 60s, that the, the voice in my community was Elijah Muhammad, who, who was the mentor of Louis Farrakhan. And I read Muhammad's speech monthly as it came out. And so I was taught to dislike, not dislike, hate the blonde haired blue eyed devil is what they taught us. And so coming to know Christ, I was like, oh my God, we wrong. And if I think I'm going to get to heaven with that ideology, I'm, I'm, I'm totally mistaken. And so coming to that knowledge in the early 90s, becoming a Christian, I began to friend other Christians. And I can remember being a great friend of Doug Neufeld around the time Promise Keepers really started racial reconciliation. And so uh, me and him built such a, a loving relationship that uh, the people from Promise Keepers thought that were local thought that we would be great for rac racial reconciliation poster boards. And so I say, Doug, I don't know what they're talking about, man. You my man. I just love you, man. You know what I'm saying? But if we can do it, let's do it. But then later on in the 90s, something else happened with, with another uh, racial incident that split the country and they say, Bob Ingo, you and Brian making come and do. And then uh, in the early 2000s, me and H. Spees, who's been brothers forever, uh, they say, man, we need you guys to do racial reconciliation. Then I remember coming here for a prayer breakfast and somebody was saying, Danny, Danny Irwell, you and Brian can go up and do. And I say, hey, man, I'm, I'm reconciled. <laughs> I'm, I'm due, man. Y'all got to find some other brothers to <laughs> reconcile too. Uh, uh, and, 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 and in that, learning that, what I find out, the biggest problem is uh, my brother's not able to really reach out to me in fear of what they might say that may be offensive to me. And I asked one brother, he said, yeah, you know, you're right, Brian. I said, but have you said anything wrong to a white person that was offensive? And he's like, yeah. I said, and how did you get through that? I love on well, love on me the same way. That's good. So there's a there's an in, inherent fear of the other or uh, just an unfamiliarity. Like we just we actually I think it, we actually are raised in different spaces, right? So as we begin to interact, that that's a that's a new skill we have to learn mm -hmm. and develop. Yeah, um, yeah. I I think it's the same. Um, so with me, people are aware of my background, where I come from. And if I, can, if I wear, because I don't wear suits in all the time, right? So you may see me in my fives, my Jordans, my T-shirt, right? And so they automatically categorize me, oh, that's one of them dudes. But if you see my heart, mm. right? And I think that's the problem with a lot of the, the United States. We see the outside of the individual and Christ always sees the heart of the individual. So if they seen past my exterior and got to know who, who I was, they would see, I just, I just want to serve God. So I was giving my testimony one time and I was talking about some of the stuff I went through and the guy tells me, well, I can't, I can't feel none of that. I said, I don't need you to feel none of that. 
I need you to thank God that the same person we serve brought me to this space to where I can talk to you about Jesus. That, that's what it's about. It's not about the other stuff. It's about our service to Jesus. And if we both are servicing Jesus, um, we, re- we can relate because we want to give back. We want to show that compassion. We want to show that grace. So the tension comes is when, when we look at each other from a fleshly, from a physical standpoint and not from a spiritual standpoint. So I try to look at people from a spiritual standpoint because the f- if we if we try to identify with the flesh, we're gonna always have problems. It's, it's gonna always be an issue, right? Because we don't like, and then you know the devil plays on certain people. Oh, look at that, look at that, I don't like that. But when you're looking at the, the core of an individual and what they stand for, I, I don't listen too much to what a person say. I listen to their heart, right? Because <laughs> their heart reveals the individual. And, and that's how I'm able to connect with certain people. There were people that were trying to turn me against me, trying to turn me against D- DJ Kreiner, right? But once I get to know, oh, you can't know. I understand their path and their walk. So that, that's how that is for me. What do you, what do you think um, shapes that perception that somebody would look at you like what, what in our culture and our upbringing shapes that perception that I would see you as a white guy and go, Ooh, I'm, I'm afraid. I, of- I think, I think home, right. I think home steals a lot of that movies, mo- uh, uh, Probably, probably workforce because it may be some dudes right like, so we automatically categorize everybody and I think that's where we have to stop sometimes uh, we have to look at the Paul said I became all things to all men so sometimes we have to become uh, uh, that well, one thing just so we can get to know that individual right? that's 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 an unfair question you have to answer that <laughs> you, you guys have to answer that you know why do you look at me and lot, I, I was standing on the corner a woman pulled up on me I was just trying to cross the street and she locked her door. I'm like, I'm just trying to cross the street. I'm not, I got my books in my hand. I'm not out here to do anything. So those are questions that, 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 that you guys have to ask. You know, why do we look at them like that? All, all, all you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> and, it, and it may not be, it may not be a 50, 50 thing, meaning like it's all, you know, or it may not be like it's all one sided because yeah. truthfully, uh, I'm a, I'm a, a white dude who's an evangelical. Now, there's a lot of assumptions you can make about a white evangelical right. dude right. that could cause differences right, right here. Right. And I think it's easy to assume right. uh, both ways. Right. Like, it, can I be honest about a microphone conversation before? Yeah, yeah. So, so this, is, this is the church I get to pastor. So right. this is home court advantage, right? And you know that. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about microphones to use. So I said, Joby and Brian, do you want a handheld or a headset? And they said, well, I'll take the handheld. Right. I said, no, 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 you gotta take a headset. Right because it's a better mic and the two white guys can't have the headset. Right, 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 <laughs> now that's right, ridiculous, right. but it's optics and it's true. And, and I, I want to make sure, and there's a sensitivity to that to say, no, no, I want to defer <laughs> right, power, right, right. authority, right. privilege, right. And, and I want to lift you up, but we, we kind of shouldn't have to have those silly conversations, right. but because of the assumptions that we're making, we, we do have to have them. Because in, in some ways, especially in today's day and age, it matters, right? Yeah, yeah. Like like I said, yeah, Brad, I wanted to make a put you in the middle and me and you and Joey could make an Oreo cookie. And I said, but I hope that don't dis- don't divide the nation. Because I said, uh, you know, and I don't, I don't, you know, th- those things, let me I'm trying to get to heaven. I did everything possible to get to hell. And Jesus arrested me. Uh, in 94, and, and, and I'll be darned if I'm going to let the color of your skin, his skin, his skin, keep me out of heaven because I, I, I done been in hell. And so I, I, I'm, I'm following the cross. Now, well, I'm following the cross. No, I, I think, and even going back to your question to Brad and I, I think, you know, what I've learned is like, you're just unconsciously shaped, right? So it's not necessarily, I, mean, I didn't grow up in a family that had, um, my parents aren't like explicitly racist, right? But I was in a suburban neighborhood. I was raised in a certain environment. So I just had prejudices that are just in me. And then that the gospel begins to root out to say like, oh, when you see somebody like, I'm locking my door. Like, I, I have to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to speak and, and say, Andrew, like, where's that coming from? Like, right. that's not Jesus. Uh, that's the sin nature, right. right? That's the sin of division uh, and exclusion. And, but it's, it's, it's just baked into me as a, as a person. We all have unconscious 
biases. Um, and so the gospel begins to speak and says, hey, like, bring those, bring those to the cross and be reconciled to your brother. I think, I, I think one of the toughest things about the racial conversation is the uh, vulnerability that you have to express. And that, so when, usually when I'm in conversations with uh, my white brothers and sisters, the first thing they always say is that, man, my, my house was not racist and you know because you're not gonna tell me that your dad had a sheet <laughs> in the things back there you know what i'm saying yeah, but he yeah, may have yeah, yeah, yeah. because i'm not foolish not to know that i i was around in the 60s i know there's people that are still walking around with uh bite marks and there's people who still walking around that sick the dogs on the people that have the bite marks but the hardest thing would be for somebody to say that my mother and my dad is racist you know, I'm telling you, man, we grew up with it. And the funny thing about us growing up, man, we grew up in a 100% African-American community, so racism was really a rumor to us because we didn't even know white people, but we were able to take on the ideology that our culture had instilled in us to hate white people. But when you come to the knowledge of who God is, all that's out the window. So um, I was gonna say, when I read the Bible, and I've read it a few times, I don't see color in there. He talks about nations, different, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Israelites, but never said the white man, the black man, the Hispanic man. So, so I think that's something people put in to categorize us. And from there, it, it, it went downhill. Absolutely, that's what I was gonna say, is, is race is a social construct. <laughs> It's not in your Bible. Yeah. We are one race, the human race. Yeah. He is made from one man, every one of us. And we're not even different colors. We used to have different levels of melanin that yeah. make us look a little different, but we're all from the same family tree. Yeah. And that, that separate race is used to, to separate us, to create a sense of division yeah. versus finding our commonality as image bearers of God. We're all in the image of God. And in that, there's such a beauty of, of worth, value, and dignity that comes from our shared ancestry. And yet somehow we, like, we have allowed those divisions to separate us. And I'm encouraged in the midst of like the theme of today, Finding Hope. I'm encouraged that yes, there's incredible division out there, but there's also bridges being built where we're beginning yeah. to recognize yeah. what the gospel has done right. to bring us together. It's a beautiful thing. It's not easy and it's certainly not without its messes, but, but I am hopeful that there is that the best in some ways is yet to come if you can. Sure. I'm going to skip over question three for now because I feel like we're already kind of getting there. So I'll just like tee it up and, and lob it up to question four here. Um, but question four, it was, how does your faith in Jesus in, impact the way you think about race or ethnicity um, and the way that you're working towards racial healing? Um, if you want to give examples of how you're doing that or, but how does Jesus, like how does the gospel, how does it affect that? Yeah, I, I, for me, it is everything or it's nothing at all. You know, uh, and we were talking earlier about uh, Joby and, and the great efforts that they were doing to uh, combat uh, uh, all the tension that was going on in our city and our state and our country and our world. And what happened was uh, I, I was looking at that and, and, and I marched with Joby and them early on, way before, you know, years ago. And, and I decided, no, you know, you know, we, we, we're great, we, we've got people who are running the, the Black Lives Matter, you know, there, there's a social wagon that you can hitch to over here, you know, Blue Lives Matter, uh, you, can, you can either go over here and ride on the donkey's back or you can go and ride on the elephant's back or you can be in, in the middle. And so in doing all that, you know, I, God showed me, say, well, okay, if you're gonna be all that, who's gonna be the church? And so I had to take a great stand and say that, man, Joby, you know, I'm loving everything, man, but I'm going straight to the cross on this one because that's the only true answer we have. You talk about, uh, we, we, we go every, everything else for an answer, we go in the Bible, but for reconciliation and all this, that's the true reconciliation. And so if we are not there, there's no way in the world 
is going to happen. Because if I hitch my wagon to Black Lives Matter, which I believe in it, if I if I if if, if I hitch my wagon to that, I'm going to go culturally what I understand about that, and I'm not going to be able to be over here at the cross praying for those guys and the black, the blue lives matter and all that. So it, it's, it's everything or it's nothing at all. So for you, it's a, a, a central, as you take any stance, it starts with the cross. Christia, that's the only stand I'm gonna take. That's, that's it, that's it. Yeah, I would say just if I could, for, for my journey at least, you know, I, I grew up as an athlete and uh, in athletics, there was no, there was really no issue with color, right? If, if the dude was better, regardless of what ethnicity he was, he played, you sat. And if you were better, he sat, you played, period. <laughs> and, uh, and then I came to Christ, and, and I came to Christ in the early 90s, right after the Rodney King riots. And uh, the division on our football team was pretty significant, and I started realizing, oh, wait a second, there is a lot going on here, and there's a lot of anger here, and, and what do we do with that? But, but I was almost naive to the whole conversation. Just coming to Christ, I was just glad to, to be saved, you know, because I was, I was, you mentioned you were on the road to hell. I, I was right there with you just yeah. in a different city. Yeah. And so coming to faith, then I, I began to sort of process what does the gospel have to say about these issues? And we had some conversations early on, in fact, when the Trayvon Martin shooting happened and, and that got me on a panel talking race. And I remember saying I was colorblind and you're, you're not allowed to say that. And of course I got crushed for yeah. saying that. And I didn't understand what that meant per se, other than like, I didn't see the issue. And then my buddy Jason Spencer, uh, who pastors Image Church here in town, invited me to his wedding. And I went to his wedding, and I think I was the only white dude in the room. And I understood yeah, what it too. meant, uh, the naivete to say I'm colorblind. Because I knew very well I was the only white dude in that room. And I realized, boy, there, there's something happening here I need to lean into. And that started some tremendous conversations, some great relationships with guys like you, with DJ, who's a dear friend. And... Uh, does the gospel mandate our reconciliation? And I would say 100% yes. Uh, the issue that I'm having with this, though, now is I think the gospel says we are already reconciled. We just need to live out that reconciliation, yeah, yeah, right. if that makes okay, sense. Right, okay. And uh, that's not, and I think we need to be careful on it. Let me say this one thing and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pass the mic. We need to be careful, especially the white community, because it can feel so dismissive. Ah, we're already, we're in Christ. There's neither Jew, Greek, male, female, slave free. We're all one in Christ. So why are we talking about this? That is so dismissive of what has happened for so long um, and the injustice and dehumanization that has taken place. So we need to acknowledge that. But we also need to acknowledge the hope that if we are one in Christ, which we are, if we do acknowledge the sins of the past, which we need to, uh, then we can actually have a conversation. So, hey, how do we walk this out today? Now, what does the gospel look like lived out in 2021 today in our city? And can we lock arms to be about living out that gospel today? That's, that's a hopeful thing, and that, I think, is part of the journey I've been on. So with me, um, they try, and, and my people, my, my brothers, right, they, you got to choose a side. I've already chosen my side when I accepted Christ. So I have to always look at doing it from God's perspective. I, I think a lot of times we looking at it from our perspective. So our perspective uh, had me siding with, with my brothers and sisters more than doing the right thing. So, and B had to pull me in on a few things like, hey, nephew, watch for this, watch for that. And, and that's wisdom, right? Because sometimes you'll go to chasing after, you'll go to chasing after an ideal instead of a purpose. And, and so, so I found myself doing things to where I was like, hold on now, I'm isolating certain brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm, so I had to cut that back and I had to step back and I say, okay, Jesus, what it is. So if I send you an individual that needs your help, I don't care what color they are, will you help them? So Christ was at, I came for the lost sheep of Israel, but when the Canaanite woman said, hey, my daughter's possessed with a demon, <laughs> he helped her. So I had to realize in context at the end of the day, the grace of God, the love of God, right? My race should not matter if that if I'm if I'm showing the grace of God. The name of my church is Grace and Truth. So whoever comes needs to get that same grace and that same truth from God's word. So I so I've have to have to not let people pull me into into what they 
want me to do and what they want me to be and who, and I have to stay in, 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 in God's will and let him shape me and be. And I think that's what happens sometimes. We become so political and so ideology and so uh, uh, whatever trends going on in our country and we have to get go and go behind it. Yeah, man, we put a, a, a we got a, a black fist on the hen Center and, and there's a picture of my fist and it has black this, black this empowerment, education, and they was like, well, why I say, why I don't say this? I'm like, it don't say Black Lives Matter, it says Black excellence. That's what it's about. We want our people to become empowered by, by the center, by those things over here. So they were already, they was getting mad at me because they didn't say the Black Lives. And I'm like, man, y'all y'all ain't said nothing about nothing no way. So y'all yeah. not gonna sway me to do what y'all want me to do. And I think that's a big thing right there. I think we, we need to remember too, the devil is a deceiver. Yeah. He's come to steal, kill and destroy. And if he can divide us, I mean, he's already won. Yeah. I, think, I think the devil is delighted by what's happened in the last, yeah. you know, several decades yeah. Yeah. Uh, to see the division that's there. And, and that's sad. And, and I think part of the problem too, and, and you kind of alluded to it, man, I hope everybody watching knows not everything on the internet is true. Right. 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 <laughs> and news what? is not news, right? right? So. So if, if you're watching CNN, you assume everybody on the other side is crazy. And if you're watching Fox News, you assume everybody on the other side is crazy. And, and I just wanna say, that's not news. And when you can have relationship with people, now you're having real conversations about real issues that are sharing real friendships uh, that reflect the gospel. And so part of the danger with COVID is we had nothing but time to just binge. And so folks who believed in this ideology entrenched themselves in that ideology. Those who believed in this one entrenched themselves over there and were just taking shots, you know, at one another. And uh, I, I'd rather live in that unsafe no man's land in the middle because I think that's where the gospel is. So, Yeah, and I, 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 what I heard from you all is that the radical um, grace of the gospel um, should break down walls. Like it should cause us to humanize, uh, to extend grace and, and, and welcome to those outside of our, our boundary, right? Like that's, that's what you're saying with the Canaanite woman. Jesus says, that boundary doesn't matter right now. And, and she can, she's going to be part of the kingdom too, right? We're going to welcome her in. Um, that's good. Well, so kind of going to that, you guys started to get onto some of the tension and division. Uh, going back to um, the riots that were happening as a response to George Floyd, um, as people that may not know, when, when leaders come to Fresno, one of the things that's said over and over is that Fresno is somehow connected. Um, and I think it's out of like our brokenness and our poverty. We've actually uh, built relationships with one another. Um, but one of the things that um, happened is Fresno did not have a huge national riot. Um, we did not have a, a huge, all this destruction of property. Um, for, from you all's perspective, like what, why? Like how did Fresno avoid uh, those riots? Yeah, I think that uh, overall Fresno is a great place. I think Fresno is a place, if we really looked at it, that we can still get our arms around it. I think with leaders like Brad stepping up and Dale Ocris and having a, 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 a great uh, law enforcement team with Salazar and those guys and a great mayor that's now, you know, a Christian. I think that uh, people really look at Fresno as a place to be proud of. Uh, during the uh, riots, you know, uh, we had great people that just wasn't going to do that. I mean, to the point where we talked early, Jovi and uh, yeah. DJ, DJ yeah. stepped up, uh, me and Brad got Captain, Salaz uh, Captain Salazar at that time to come out here in front of everybody. And we had 40 officers out there praying for him with about 30 pastors praying for him. Uh, I think I really want to salute our pastors at the church. When you talk about an opportunity where the church has missed a lot of things, the civil rights movement, Jim Crow stuff and all that different stuff. We seen the church in this particular time and era through 2020 really step up, even to the point where Joby then went and put their lives on the line. You, you can talk a little bit about So it. even the big one that was downtown, um, I think it was 3,000, almost 4,000 people. I was there, right? And not only I was there, but some of them guys that went to Washington D.C. They're not they're they're domestic terrorists. They're they they were there 
to the point that the stage was right here and they was right behind us. So it's, and it was a, a the lady was speaking and a guy comes out the crowd and he comes straight towards these people. So I'm like, this can't be real. And he goes right exactly to where these terrorists are and starts picking at them. I'm like, man, this is a setup. They trying to call. So we all surround them, me, DJ Kreiner, um, CJ, Aaron Foster. So we all get there like, hey, we not having this. You got to go, man. And he like, oh, no, no, no. I'm like, no. And it was the same guy who harassed Miguel Arias at his home. See, all that group was there. So and, and, and as we began to march, they had bricks in place. Like, because they wanted, people wanted something to go down. But because we caught it, because we seen it, we were able to curve it and we're walking through the crowd. I'm in the midst of the crowd, me and some of my, some of the kids from the school, because I want them to see firsthand experience how real this stuff is. And they're walking there, hey, you make, watch, watch this group over there. And we on the walkie talkies, right? And, and we got people patrolling it just to make sure everything goes the way God would want it to go. Yeah, it's leadership. Yeah. These guys are incredible. I mean, I went down to the, the uh, Black Lives Matter march. It was downtown. And uh, you guys have eyes to see I did what I didn't even see. You know, I'm just looking around like, man, what, what's going on? And you could feel it. There was a lot of tension there. But the incredible leadership. And, and the thing about the body of Christ in Fresno, it's incredible. And, and the unity that we are growing into. And truthfully, I think we're just getting started. And, and the, the Mavericks that have gone before, um, whether it's Pastor Riggins from St. Rest years ago, whether it's... Um, Pastor Binion at Westside, who's been doing it for a long, long time, uh, whether it's Pastor Carricker and Johnson from Northwest and People's Church back in the day, the new generation that's stepping up is finding a commonality together to say, what are you doing? What's happening? How can we help you? What are you doing? What are you doing? And, and there's a networking that's taking place. It's beautiful, but uh, leadership. The, uh, the pastors in our community, specifically African-American pastors in our community, were unbelievable, especially in that time. I, and what you're naming, you mentioned HP, is he uses a term called spiritual infrastructure. Um, and I, I love that term because I think we have leaders in our community, like you just named a bunch, right, that have been building that spiritual infrastructure. Um, and we cannot take that for granted as a community, right? Like we get to continue to do that. You that are listening, you get to continue to build that spiritual infrastructure that God gets to use for his reconciliation in our, in our community. And so I think we don't take that for granted. Um, starting to move into that kind of like uh, next step piece is as you guys pray towards the future, as you pray for the church uh, around the issues of race, like what is the prayer um, what is the gut stirring that you just like long for? Yeah, I, uh, uh, I think that uh, this is it, man. When we see panels of diversity coming together, not not afraid. I I I, I, I please, Brad, because that's my that's my guy, that's my boy. Now, he was in the conversation. He say, oh, this is my boy. And they say, you shouldn't say that because who he said it to was African-American or black or whatever, whatever we call it this year or next year or whatever we'll be. <laughs> but, uh, and I told Brad, I said, well, Brad, I don't care. You my boy and I'm your boy. Because we, we, we are fooling ourselves if we think the scripture that said, I think I heard somebody say it today that, uh, how can you, I think it might've been Joe or somebody, but how can you say you love me and who you ain't seen and you don't love your brother and who you see and think that we're going to get to heaven? It's not going to work. It might work in your all, in your culturally set up situation for you at that particular time, but whoa, when, when you get there. And so when we see efforts like what Brad is doing, even bringing me on, on staff. He, he, I, I'm qualified to be on this staff because 100%. I serve a living God and he, and he understands that. And, and, and so to, to, to reach across to say, hey, Brian, I, I want you on my staff. I need you on my staff. Not, not, not as no tokenism, but because of what God has done in your life, you can help me and help the mission of what this church looks, looks looking forward to doing. And to be able to work with guys like Joby and bring that down there is what I'm truly hoping that we can continue to see. 
absolutely, you got 30 years of experience in Southwest Fresno. I mean, there's, there's not a better person to have on our staff to connect the needs of the community with the church that might be able to rally others towards, you know, fulfilling those needs. I think to answer your question, here's one of my concerns. Uh, a lot of folks that are watching this are podcasters and readers, and I, I just want to caution folks with this. Not everything putting out right now, being written and podcasted, is gospel-centered and unifying. Critical race theory is not anything that's gospel-centered or unifying. And there's a lot of authors that are out there, and I'd name them, but I don't want to dime them out. But to say this, just be careful what you're reading. Because even things that look like in the name of Jesus, they're helping, you know, connect people. It's not always a helpful message. And the, the only helpful message we have is when we in humility come together and do life together, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another. And so just be careful because the, the narrow gap of having these race conversations is narrowing by the minute. And you're either a racist or you're an anti-racist and there's nothing in the middle. And I'm not convinced either one of those is healthy. That's just my opinion, just, just from where I'm sitting. And so just be careful that everything we're reading, learning, listening to is actually gospel-centered and drawing us back to the oneness that we are experiencing in Christ. And uh, that, that's something I'm, I'm mindful of. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. It's just, man, when we begin to see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, right, and, and understanding that we all need unity, we all need to serve with each other, right, and we just want to give. Like, like I got told everybody, when I got into ministry, I just wanted to serve Christ. I didn't know nothing about the, the, the business meetings. I didn't know nothing about the outreach committee. I, I just, God put it on my heart to serve God. So when people begin to see that there are brothers and sisters who just want to serve God and it's not about color, they just want to give back and, and, and give them the, their best, I think then as a church body, right, we can all begin to come together, we all begin to flow because understanding that it has to be the gospel. It's about delivering people, getting them to know Jesus Christ and letting our light shine. And, and that's what it's about. Um, so speaking, I would love for you all, uh, Brad, you kind of did right there. Um, speak, you know, to the average person. They're not a leader on stage. They're not preaching. They're not leading a nonprofit, right? Um, like they live in, in, you know, whatever neighborhood in our town. Like how do they, how do they join the vision that you would see God, you know, having for our racial healing in our community. Uh, is there, is there an action you would say that they should do? Is there something they should read or not read? Like uh, what, what is the action step that you would say, Hey, from this conversation, go blank. I would say, come join the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> four, four <grand> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm just sold out for Jesus, man. You know, and understand that uh, 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 he will uh, direct your path. You know, uh, I was talking to Justin before and he just said, man, all I know, man, I wanted to be, I wanted to serve. I wanted to do something and God began to place him in different positions. And some of them hard. I remember when I first started ministry back in, 90, uh, 93, 94 at World Impact was an inner city missionary. And I began to, uh, a, a young man, uh, Willie Harris got murdered at going home from Edison. And uh, it was a big publicity and his, and his mom was meeting and we had meetings, meetings. And we said, we're not gonna stop meeting here until we find some three weeks later, we stopped meeting. And I seen his mother and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just starting, but ministry, but if you want to meet with me, I'll meet with you. And all of a sudden I met with her on a Wednesday at World Impact. Next thing I know, I had 17 different families I'm meeting with who lost kids through senseless violence, murder. And I was sitting there and I'm like, oh God, it, it, it's crazy because you have me ministering to people that I have, with the ideology I had at the, as a gang member, I was a drive-by shooter. And drive-by shooters brought these families together, but some type of way you have placed a drive-by shooter in the midst of these families to bring healing to. So just being willing to see what God has for you. Yeah, I would simply say, I think if we look at our sphere of influence and it looks a lot like you, 
Mm -hmm. uh, just recognize that we're going to spend eternity together in heaven, according to Revelation 7, with every tribe, tongue, and nation. So you might want to get used to living in some diversity now because we're going to be singing some gospel music and some country music and some whatever music in glory, right? So we might want to get used to that. So my, my encouragement to people would be if, if we are from Adam, all of us, and even from Noah and his descendants, if we are one race, the human race, if ethnicity is a beautiful gift to the body of Christ, if our faith in Jesus informs our ethnicity, opposed to our ethnicity informing our faith in Jesus, then we actually have more in common than we thought. Yes, yes. And if that's indeed the case, and you look around your sphere of influence, and it looks a lot like you, don't be ashamed by that. Just know you're missing out. There, there is a richness in my life that I experience now. Uh, having some relationships with guys who don't look like me that I didn't have before. And I'm very grateful for that. Right. And, uh, and, and, it, and it spans the gap of all kinds of things that you get just doing, for, just doing life with friends. Right. When you're around friends, you, you begin to talk like them and act like them and dress like them and you're influenced by them. And I'm very like thankful. <laughs> I got my tango on. Order, so I'm, I'm coming, I no, but I'm, I'm very thankful for that influence. And so I would simply say this in a non-shaming, non-guilting way, look around and find people that you can authentically begin to build relationships with, not as a token, and don't even worry about, well, will they perceive it as being a token? Will I just go be a friend? And if you'll just go be a friend, what you'll find is the richness that comes with diversity and I think at least for me personally, I've experienced a little bit of that. I want more of that. And I want to continue to lean into that. It's been good for my spiritual life and a good reminder of the gospel. And, and I learned, because um, that's, that's how I started. I want to go help my people. I want to go help my friends. So I went and found out that my friends didn't really want my help. <laughs> right? And so God began to take me to other people who didn't necessarily look like me, didn't necessarily share my background and history but he allowed me to help them and they and so in turn helped me. And I think that's what the, what this is about, right? So now I can't be, I, now I gotta understand your, your life, your, the way you walk, why you do things, the way you do things. And, and, and that's how we grow as individuals because now I'm learning from you and you're learning from me and we grow together. So that's, that's what I learned. Yeah. That's sweet, that's so good. Um, it takes commitments, right? It takes like actual commitments to live in new ways. Uh, and that's what the gospel, it's all about discipleship, right? Uh, it actually takes us living in new ways. Um, I'm going to be selfish here and plug, uh, we, uh, we don't have time for the video, but I'll throw up a link uh, on the back uh, screen if we could. Uh, EMP is doing a curriculum called Living Undivided. It starts on the 17th. Uh, you can see the link there, bit.ly uh, slash living and then undivided is capitalized. Um, uh, you can also go to the Every Neighborhood Partnership Facebook page. So an awesome class. It's about living undivided. Like how do we live as a, as a unified body of Christ? How does the gospel inform, inform those decisions? So uh, that's coming up starting the 17th. If you'd be interested, you can go to our Facebook page and find that. Um, Joby, would you pray for us? Um, pray for those that are watching. Pray for the, the Church of Fresno. I celebrate so much what God has done. And man, I want to be a city that the world, the United States looks at and just goes, what, what is going on in Fresno Clovis? Like whatever is happening, God has done something and his glory will be shared in the midst of that. So pray for that for us. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you uh, for today, for this opportunity to, to share um, our views and our thoughts, but more so what you think about this racial stuff and how you see the church and our role, Father God. So I just want to say, um, watch over each and every one of us, protect us, Give us that wisdom and that understanding, Lord, as we continue to labor for your kingdom, as we continue to go out and reach the lost. And Father God, also to bring that um, a ministry of reconciliation, that message of hope and uh, oneness as we all continue to labor in your field. Father God, we thank you for all that you have done and where you have um, brought us from, Father God, to bring us to this place in this space at this time, Lord, just being available to be used, Lord. So I thank you. I thank you for those watching who have partaken and, and, and those who have presented, Lord, just watch over all of us, cover us in your glory and your righteousness, Lord. Allow us always uh, bear the full armor of God on as we go out into these, into this, into our ministries, Father God, and begin to combat the forces out there, Father God. But thank you. Thank you for being that light in this dark world, Father God, that others may always look to and find hope in Jesus Christ. I thank you. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
So good. Um, so this is being recorded. So feel free. You can share that. Um, we'll post this on the living on uh, the um, Discover Fresno. I think it's Discover Fresno 2020, 21 um, website. And uh, so it'll be recorded. You could share that there. And then our link for our next session will be there as well. So thanks for tuning in and appreciate you joining us.